uh, the original question was, I was just <laughs> caught. <coughs> okay. It's about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, um, people say there's, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is mysterious, and to a certain degree that is true. It's true. But um, what we find, not only uh, what Jesus says, no, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? But what we need to understand is that we see Jesus, we also get, um, I suppose, a summing up of what the Spirit's nature is like as well. Because um, now when the Spirit, the purpose of the Spirit uh, was to point us to Christ so that we know the nature of the Spirit through Christ and of course through uh, by the Spirit pointing us to Christ and we know the Father in Christ and as you say it's all self-effacing now without the revelation of Christ we come to this problem of holiness we'd be still stuck in oblivion in regard to what holiness is about because um, grace is holiness in action so we see holiness at work in Christ on this earth I think that's enormously uh, significant because what has happened through the ages is there's been a wedge place between God and grace. Between holiness and grace. Yeah, and between holiness and grace. It's, it's an attribute, uh, attribute, which is really a picture of how uh, Greek philosophy works. Is that Now, if you go right back to the origins of uh, Greek mythology, you have the supreme being and... Uh, grace or uh, Karitos was a demon he was typified as a demon along with um, you know, uh, faith or Pistis was a demon right? so it wasn't God it was something like a form that didn't really connect with God so in with the advent of Jesus Christ what you have is all of that turned upside down because what we have is form and being united. So grace and God become united as one. So when we look at grace, which it really is the loving kind acts of God, Amen. right? it gives us a view deep into the heart of God. So we see how Christ acts amongst sinners we see holiness in action which is really our witness to the true loving nature of God and so the purpose of the spirit really is to point us back to Christ to really see holiness in action to see how God acted to and, see and by holiness you mean grace right so we see how God acts that he comes so close to humanity I don't, I, I, the only way I can describe this is in, if you see in some movies where there's a great battle at the end right, and um, it looks like the hero is going to fall the, to the death but he doesn't want the enemy to get away with it so he grabs the enemy and draws him in close and they might fall, both fall Together. to their deaths to save the whole of humanity or to uh, save them from whatever might be happening against them. The same thing happened with the gospel is that God came to us as the man Jesus Christ, grabbed humanity and brought him close into himself and he would not let go. And so when humanity drove Jesus to the cross, what they didn't realise is that they were driving themselves <laughs> to the cross to bring about the ultimate Beautiful. victory... Beautiful that Jesus and God uh, were trying to bring about, which was to not allow death, does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. To not allow <laughs> death to, to interfere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, as I was saying, it's to not allow death to get in the way between humanity and the love of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah, right? So th that's what the Spirit does. Is he points to Christ so that we can be reminded of all the, not only the things he did, said, but the things he actually did as a human being. Now, this Spirit, 
he blows on us, does he? And does he reveal Christ in us? He reveals Christ and in us. Does he take the things of Christ and share it with us? Yes, because he is the spirit of Christ. Uh, because, uh, now, your Father, Son, and Spirit, it's the one being of God that is... Um, now they're in union, they're in communion, they know each other inside out. Now uh, there, there's something that there's nothing that they're not hiding from each other, and their a desire, which has been before the creation of the world, is that they reveal the whole of themselves as much as we're able to, you know, uh, assimilate into ourselves of who they truly are through the witness of yeah, Jesus so Christ. Sure. With that unity in God. Right. Yeah. How does that relate to us? How does God relate to us in, in relation? I mean, there is the Godhead, right? beautifully united <coughs> amongst themselves. Yeah. How does that bear on you and me? Well, I think it comes back to um, now we see this overwhelming loving kind act towards us in the person of Christ that we let him love us Whoa. we let him love us so, you know, uh, so, and so this eternal love yeah. in this relationship has come down in the person of Christ and Christ is now being placed in our heart yes. and the spirit's wafting on us to unveil the things of Christ so he's saying let me love, love you. you let me love you so, so, so the, the spirit is just reminding us of how much we're loved now, how much, you know, um, as I was saying to someone in the break, that, that the Spirit reveals to us that God is so close to us that he's closer to us than we are to ourselves. That he's got right underneath our being. Ooh. You know, uh, far deeper than we can ever get. And love is just so filtering from bottom so to top. Deuteronomy, underneath are the everlasting arms. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stuart. It was beautiful. Yeah. But during the break, um, one person um, said, hey, you missed a few things in, in your uh, spiel on Greek uh, thought. Um, and, um, and, hey, I missed more than a, f <laughs> more than a few. Um, but the point that she made was a very good point, and that is that, that one of the terrible things that's happened about this in this notion of splitting things apart comes to uh, the notion that René Descartes um, brought to us uh, in, in the uh, late medieval period where he, he drove a wedge between our intelligible uh, uh, being, our mind, and our bodies, right? And so, you know, within the, some ideas in the church we have this idea that the spirit kind of sits inside the machine of the human body and we're not really who we are it's the spirit that's sitting inside our own spirit right that that's kind of the ghost in the machine uh, this is this cartesian idea and the sad thing about that is is the thing that we've been talking about here in reverse it's a splitting process isn't it you know the the thing about much that of that goes wrong in the world is about breaking uh, it's about breaking apart, breaking us apart from God, breaking Jesus apart from Israel, right? breaking Jesus Christ apart from Jesus of Nazareth, mm. right? breaking, splitting, splitting. But what Stuart was talking about and what we've been talking about before is about union, oneness, unity. Right? And so God's about a very different process, isn't he? As, as he comes in in the man Jesus Christ, into the world, he remakes our creation from the inside out, mm. right? Without violating us, right? Without um, dominating us, he comes in amongst us, into us, gives us his spirit, right? Which, as Stuart was saying, you know, delves in between the sinews of our bones, del delves into the very depth of our being. So suddenly we have a very different understanding of ourselves. We have a very different understanding of ourselves. We have an understanding of ourselves as one being, a human being with mind, spirit.
spirit, soul, body. Huh? And so, you know, Job could say, you know, though this body of mine rots in the grave, yet with these eyes and in this body will I see God. Huh? It's a very different, uh, it's a very different, it's a very healing, it's a very healing story, isn't it? So, I mean, the beauty of this story is about God uniting himself with us in this deep, powerful union that takes place in the incarnation, right? Takes place on the cross, takes place as he takes us up in the resurrection, takes place as he takes us up with him in the ascension so that we participate in the very being of God himself. Wow. Not that we are gods, but that we are given through Jesus Christ a place, a place in the very being of, of God himself. And what that does is it, it heals the splitting. Right? So yeah. where was Descartes? Off with the fairies. Right? This notion of, of a split uh, understanding of in the intelligible and the sensory world, it goes back to Plato. Mm. Right? It's nothing new under the sun, just Greek ideas reworked. Right? So today in modern philosophy, this so-called Cartesian turn has been overthrown. Right? Thank God for that. So we actually live in an age which I think is much more friendly to the gospel. If we would get the gospel right. Yeah. Oh. Well, we, you can do that in a minute, yeah. Bruce. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, we live in an age in which, which many of these ideas, these, these ideas that, uh, that split things apart, have changed. Right? And... Um, and that again is, is something for another night but we do live in an age in which uh, the philosophy of our age the sciences of our age are much more concerned with unity much more and uh, much more concerned with the uniting of things perhaps I should say something about this that in the Newtonian view of the world I, I, my PhD is in physics in the Newtonian view of the world you have this notion of a container view of space and time so space and time is somehow, um, you know, like the tea canister that sits on your shelf, right? And in order for poor old God to get in this, he's got to lever the lid off, right? He's got to lever the lid off and then snuck inside that, right? And, um, and when, you know, Newton wrote more books on theology than he ever wrote on, on physics, and, but he was a deist. He wasn't um, Trinitarian. He was a, a deist in his understanding. And ha so he spoke of the mind of God, by which he meant the real nature of space and time. Absolute mathematical space. Absolute mathematical space and time, by which <laughs> everything had to move in relation to, it was dictated to by it. So, you know, one of the guys I used to work with used to give me a hard time about the fact that poor old Jesus was up there in heaven playing his fiddle because it was so boring in all that time he had. Huh? But of course his fallacy was that's not the way space and time are and God is not subject to them anyway. So what happened with Albert Einstein was a total transformation of the Newtonian ideas. Suddenly they were no longer the mind of God, something that we were dictated by, they became one with us. Subject to light. Subject to light, subject to relationship. Mm. What were they really? Space and time were expression of relationship. So one of the incredible things that takes place through the work of Albert Einstein and prior to him, Maxwell and Michael Faraday, two people, by the way, who are beautiful Christian people, Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell, deeply imbued in Trinitarian theology and it's not surprising that the idea of the field came out of both of these people and that was the idea that Einstein took and broke the Newtonian paradigm broke the Newtonian paradigm so we went from something which was mechanistic forced down upon us mm. encapsulating us holding God out mm. we went to an understanding of the universe as primarily relational. And, uh, and there are wonderful stories in mathematics, in philosophy, and in other parts of, of modern thought that uh, are 
wonderful analogies with the Christian gospel. Whoa.